Um, well, Daniel, this is kind of crazy. This is almost like having the opportunity to have a, a podcast conversation with you. Um, it doesn't have to go as long as a podcast, but I thought perhaps I could, I could pose a question to you about uh, something we're both really interested in, which is uh, ontological design. Um, you know, I've been thinking about ontological design for years, and I still don't feel that I've wrapped my head fully around its implications. But in a nutshell, ontological design has to do with the design of our being. And it has to do with the circular relationship between our creative and our linguistic choices, our design choices in the world and our internal experience. So that what we design designs us in turn. And, and most people don't see the second part of that circle, right? We're all aware that we have agency and we can design things in the world, but we don't spend a lot of time thinking about how the things that we design also have agency and in turn design us right back. Yeah. And, and so that's sort of my limited take on ontological design. And I know you're working on a, on a book uh, on this subject. Yeah. I know that this has taken possession of you. This idea has taken hold of you and of your and of your life and has come to define so much of what you think about. Yeah. So do you mind just offering a summation or a brief uh, a brief sort of take on, on ontological design and, yeah. and, and, and what, what you're trying to do in this book? So look if you don't mind. Of course. Uh, ontological design is really this idea that the creative disciplines are today in a position where they can take over the task of designing these infrastructure for reality that are so deep that they become ontological, that they design the way we see the world. These glasses are framing how you see the world, they're framing how you think, how you're feeling right now. And so that has an impact on you. But people usually when they design, they don't really understand this circular relationship like you mentioned, right? They just think I'm designing a product or I'm designing an app. But I think in the next few years, people are going to start to realize, especially as the internet moves and, and moves and stampedes forward, they're going to realize that, wait a minute, we need to understand and take, take charge and take some sovereignty of this aspect that technology has on us. It's, it's, it's ontologically generative and people are going to be really empowered if they're able to take that and you know deploy that as a creative discipline, as a design discipline, maybe as the next evolution of the young discipline that is on uh, UX design, user experience design. So maybe because, because user experience design is really, as Eric Davis would say, engaging the technical material of subjectivity itself, right? Like the more you understand. Um, the, the, the capacity that we have to steward our lived experience, the more something like user interface design really is the design of subjectivity. It's, it's mind design. And, and you know, you use the example of me putting on these sunglasses, which incidentally are intentionally designed to give a color therapy experience. They're called Loving Victorious Beings Color Therapy Glasses. When I put them on, my world becomes sepia toned. My world becomes orange. My world becomes italicized. The prose of my experience shifts, right? And when I put them on, I exercise agency over my experience in the same way that an Instagram filter allows you to change the aesthetic impact of that photo by charging it with poignancy, by vintaging it. And so, when I think about ontological design and its implications, user interface design, mind design, it makes me think then that this becomes an inter enterprise, a set of protocols and procedures to literally, literally author subjectivity itself, the holy grail, right? Because, you know, in a world where everybody's trying to sell you like a guide to happiness or a guide to a more fulfilling life, like, like you're talking about sculpting you know, sculpting interior that's precise, life. That's precisely what it is. And it relates to alchemy in many ways. But let me yes. tell you something. Um, you know, user interface design is operating under the assumption that attention and human time will scale just like plastic scales. In other words, I can build, I can have a factory that builds one bottle of water 
but I can also sort of update my technology and start to scale this operation and I can sell a million bottles of water. Mm -hmm. But there's a limited amount of attention the human has, namely it's 24 hours per day. It does not scale, doesn't have the same properties as other prime matters have. Okay. So if we're talking about alchemy, we're talking about manipulating the materia prima, the prima materia of, of uh, great work, if you will, which is kind of a very interesting metaphor because ontological design is kind of the update of this alchemy. Then what we're talking about is having a new frame to talk about user experience design. And that new frame understands that oh wait a minute we cannot exploit attention endlessly because people have limited attention and what we're doing with this attention design is not so much exploit because that will fuck people up it's just like the Facebook as the slot machine paradigm which people yeah, no, are I, we don't want our lived experience to become a dopamine slot machine reality that sounds or horrible Precisely. but, but what we're in fact we're, what, we're, what I think we would be interested in is better designing deeply meaningful experiences for ourselves you know, like I've seen these interesting um, videos about like the art of movie trailers mm. or the art of making films. Like we had to learn how do you steward a mind for two hours of entertainment? Why do stories have story arcs? You know, why do we interpret meaningful experiences with beginning, middle and end? Like how do you how do you pattern a deeply meaningful experience? Like I think cinema is one of the best most perfected forms of ontological design. I mean, when I sit in that movie theater, I, I surrender to an experience that has been scripted by Chris Nolan, and, and, and my mind meets a version of its own process. Like, consciousness meets its own process when we watch films, but films are a, a patterning of our consciousness. They are ontological design, and it's, it's, and it's, one, it's, it's one iteration of this idea that already exists and that works. Um, but that's very different than hijacking our attention in a slot machine, dopamine, fucking yeah. attention hijacking reality. So yeah. in the future, the better we get at authoring consciousness, at authoring subjectivity, um, how do we make sure that we do it to engender forms of beauty, rapture, ecstasy, and, and exquisitely patterned you know, music that will melt the stars for ourselves? versus turning ourselves into like you know cocaine addled rats you know in a hamster yeah. wheel that keep going back to the cocaine instead of the food until they die so the ontological framing of your question already precludes the form of answering it which is why i'm going to re reframe it myself and you're, you'll see what i'm trying to do here um the christopher nolan paradigm is the broadcast society paradigm it's where the media reality that we all live in is gates kept by Hollywood and by these bigger institutional uh, sort of craft holders, yeah. the, the dream weavers for society who, who dream the dreams for everyone else to dream or to live. Uh, but we're moving towards the age of the internet and, and that transition to digital is one where we'll see the craft that was before held by, by the Hollywood and by the ontological designers of the previous age and is now going to become a little bit more perhaps decentralized. And if it doesn't naturally, there will be a demand, there will be a market for that. Because if you look at what social media has done, what the internet has done, it has decentralized everything, it atomized everything. And the last or perhaps the next threshold of that atomization, as the internet reaches maturity in the 2020s and 2030s, is going to be ontological designing your reality itself, not only your own view or your own reality bubble on Facebook or Not Instagram. just the movies you watch, but who you are when you're home, who you are when you wake up, the thoughts you think. All these things are up for grabs. So you're not only watching movies that come out of Hollywood in this gate-capped, sanctioned reality that is very, head, you know, it, it's not really that uh, sort of troublesome. Yeah. Rather, you can actually enter these other mimetic realms that can be governed by who knows who, who for whatever means. Uh, it's kind of this this free for all as we enter this this age of as some people call it fourth generation warfare. <laughs> so it becomes like mimetic warfare and reality hijacking. And before you know it, you've been made into a flat earther or some other kind of like reality tunnel victim culty, so to speak. It's you a know? newological Mad Max. A newological Mad Max. I think that's where we're going in the future, especially. Well, that kind of scares me, except when you think of what Burning Man is. Yeah. Is 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 perhaps the most utopian expression of this. Um, Just get with the right designers. Yeah. Eric Davis, he described Burning Man as um, 
A promiscuous carnival of souls, a, demo a demolition derby of reality constructs colliding on a parched void. Fucking so up. reality constructs are a thing, and in Burning Man, people are intentional about the fact that reality is multiple, reality is relative, and reality can be constructed and deconstructed and reconstructed Precisely. anew. Precisely. Um, but, um, but at least the intentions of those that go to Burning Man is one of, like, you know, radical self-expression, radical self-reliance. I mean, there's still values, and, and there's still... Um, there's still, uh, I would say, guardrails. There, there's no exploitation at Burning Man, I would hope. Yeah, other than the one that's already implicit with, you know, the capitalist dynamics. But let's not dive too much into that. <laughs> no, seriously, there's, there's, it's, it's just, the ball is rolling now. There's not really much else where we, that, that we can go towards. But yes, these people at Burning Man are actually experimenting with the plastic and na nature uh, of reality. The plastic nature of perception and its malleability and obviously that's such an iconic thing to bring up whenever we talk about uh, ontological design is because there's ways to mediate human relationships in there that you utilize expression that utilize even all of these weird currencies that people are experimenting with that are meant to invent new ways to sustain realities now the best designers perhaps of the future will be the ones that are figure out how to sustain a reality for a long time uh -huh. in god we trust is written on the back of the dollar bill it is a theological implication that underpins reality. It's the universal alchemical object. The, the Philosopher's Stone is in our pockets. This bill can buy anything. So you understand what I'm getting out of this. It's, it's, it's a way to, to manipulate reality and it will get decentralized. Uh, and there's a craft to do that. That's the whole point of, of what I'm trying to write with the book. But in the end, are you? is the message in your book... I mean, it's, it's, is, it, is it going to give people to read it a sense of increased agency and stewardship of their reality field or is it actually going to send them tumbling down the rabbit hole acting as a totem for ontological uncertainty like the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland that implies the world is not what it seems it's 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 totally the first one it's okay. it's Odin's world spear it's the idea that here's how you can navigate the coming nomadic ages because bear in mind right we've been living in this very, you know, in this late stage Western based globalist empire based on the dollar and on America, and we have all these channels. I speak English, right? Look at what, what the fuck is going on here. There's a series of, of structures, right, that we rely on. And I think that we're slowly, right, this is how geopolitics moves, slowly moving towards another period that is more digital, perhaps less America centric. And what that's going to imply. Is, is up for grabs but the main thing is that we are all now players mm. so when uh, uh, what's this guy's name Giorgio Agamben someone so there's a philosopher I can't recall the name right now he says something like our perceptions have become mili mi become militarized uh, the speed of capitalism has become in itself a battlefield there's some uh, uh, Patrick Ryan says something like uh, civilization is the battlefield the weapon of battle and the reward for battle simultaneously. <laughs> Our attention is simultaneously these three things. It's a trinity. You see again how the theology comes back again to this alchemical subject matter. So that's where we're moving towards. And it's empowerment that, that is ultimately the message here. Empowerment. Daniel Fraga, man. I could talk to you for hours. I'm excited about your book. I'm excited about your mind. Thank you for what you do. I'm sure people at home are totally inspired by um, the way in which you rhapsodize through a tumbling thicket of ideas with such a sharp and vital alacrity that it can take the breath away. <laughs> uh, you flatter me very much. <laughs> Cheers, bro. That was good. Wow. That was fun, man. Can't wait to watch that. Now continue. Now continue? <laughs> now we continue.